The, um, I wished <clears throat> that you understood how many studies <clears throat> that we've been taking little pieces of and trying to put them into a few brief studies here. Um, you would see the, the difficulty and try to cut this down to a weekend presentation. I'm not, Sister White says we're not supposed to make apologies. I'm not making apologies. I'm trying to keep you informed of, of what the reason this may seem a little bit choppy to you. But I had another um, criticism here in this last break, and I, and I have to throw it out to you in connection with this. Um, typical criticism for me, an accurate criticism, something that I need to work on is as I'm laying out the prophetic message, I don't spend a great deal of time emphasizing um, the experience that we must develop to be among the 144,000 and how the prophetic message brings about that experience and what is our part in making sure that we attain that experience. And, um, and what I can tell you is that, and it's probably not a correct position, but with the little bit of time that we had here, we're barely getting through the basic prophetic structure of things, but if, if all we learn is the, the sequence of events correctly as they're outlined in prophecy, and we don't bring our character and our life into agreement with the message of prophecy, then it's worthless. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we, we all understand that going in. And I'm trusting that if you do test what we're teaching here prophetically and find that it is so, that the Holy Spirit is going to convict you um, of these other truths that we know in Adventism. Um, uh, we are at the conclusion. But if you spoke to my wife, she would tell you that I can go on and on and on for a conclusion, so don't, don't sigh yet. We're at the conclusion. Um, in Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 447, it says, A transforming power attended the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages, as it attends the message of the third angel. So in this history, there was a transforming power, and that's going to be repeated again. Continuing on, she says, Lasting convictions were made upon human minds. The power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. And that's, that's the point here I want to dwell on for a while. In this history, from 1840 to 1844, the power of the Holy Spirit was manif manifested from beginning to end. Now, I'm going to try to make the point that even though the mighty angel came down of heaven, out of heaven in Revelation 10 with the little book of Daniel open in his hand, and from this point on, the Millerites were tested by the light that was coming out of the prophetic word, and the testing process ultimately honed down that group to 50 people. Christ's bringing this little book here at the beginning. Among other things, it's announcing that the, the final purification process of the Millerites had begun. But in this time period, the, the power of the Holy Spirit was manifested throughout it, but the 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 most powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit in this time period was in the midnight cry. So there's like a part A and a part B within this history. This is the manifestation of the power of God, but prophetically, when you're, you're isolating the different components, it's in the midnight cry when the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. And what we're suggesting, we have some more to say about this, is that just as the four angels of Revelation 9 being restrained on August 11th, 1840. And we're saying that because at the beginning of this time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days, there are four angels that are loosed for this time period. Therefore, at the end of this time period, August 11th, 1840, there are four angels restrained. This is prefiguring the restraining that takes place by the four angels in Revelation 7. And, while, and we understand the Seventh-day Adventists that the reason those four angels are restraining the winds of strife is so that God's people can be sealed. The restraining of the angels um, during the sealing, the restraining of the winds by the angels 
marking the sealing time of the 144,000s, has been paralleled and prefigured by the restraining of these four angels, um, which were Islam. And we're suggesting that the role of Islam in Bible prophecy is they are the ones that anger the nation, and they are symbolized, Islam is symbolized, by the, the angry horse, and Sister White says the angry horse is the winds of strife. So there's, there's a direct connection and in inspiration between Revelation 7, the restraining of the winds of strife, and the restraining of the four angels of Islam that begins this time period, 1840 to 1844, and is prefiguring the sealing time of the 144,000, the sealing time which is underway here on planet Earth today. But one of the things that Sister White calls this time period is period when the power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. In Great Controversy 611, she says this. To me, this is one of the important texts in this particular study. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. This is the fourth angel of Revelation 18. She says, the angel who unites in proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. And in some countries, there was the greatest religious interest which has ever been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be repeated, are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. Please notice, Sister White is saying that this history is a glorious manifestation of the power of God and that she's comparing this history with what takes place when the fourth angel joins the third. We're suggesting this history is repeated and she's saying that this history here, 1840 to 1844, is a glorious manifestation of the power of God. This is Great Controversy 611. Um, so, but these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. Notice the next paragraph, next sentence, but it's a paragraph. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. And then she goes in and describes Pentecost. And so she has one paragraph where she introduces the, the, when the fourth angel comes down and lightens the earth with, her, with his glory. And she immediately compares that with 1840 to 1844, and she tells us that this history of 1840 to 1844 is a glorious manifestation of the power of God. And then she tells us it's similar to Pentecost. And what was Pentecost? Pentecost was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. Pentecost is when the early rain was poured out upon the church, prefiguring, paralleling, pointing forward to when the latter rain of the fourth angel's message is poured out upon the, the Lord, and then, or upon God's people. And then in the next paragraph, she says, the work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of fresh refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Now, so you understand why I'm making this emphasis. Is I'm suggesting that when the latter rain begins to fall, there will be two groups in Adventism and one group will recognize that the latter rain is falling and one won't. If we are to recognize that the latter rain is falling, how are we to recognize it? And what I'm suggesting is, is that the way that we recognize it 
is by looking to the beginnings. Jesus illustrates the end with the beginnings. And there are certain histories where inspiration has specifically told us that the power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. And these histories are all parallel and prefigure the outpouring of the latter rain. The primary history for Seventh-day Adventists that illustrates the manifestation of the power of God that Seventh-day Adventists are to understand is the history from 1840 to 1844. Therefore, our point is this. If and when we see the history of the Millerites from 1840 to 1844 being repeated, then we know that the manifestation of the power of God in the latter reign has begun. And we know that we've entered into a time period when there's a purification process that takes place among the virgins of Adventism, just as there was a purification process that took place among the virgins of the Millerites. And what we're suggesting is, is that in spite of all the reasons there are for you and I to disbelieve this, that this time period has already begun. Now, if, when you look at it closely then, you have, to, you have to mark out certain details. One of them is, is that the latter rain is not poured out without measure until the Sunday law in the United States, because that is the issue that purifies God's church. Uh, brothers and sisters, for over the past 10 or 15 years, the things that I've shared prophetically, I, I've become familiar with which ones get resisted more than others, which ones get attacked, and for many years people wanted to attack the idea that probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists at the Sunday Law. I mean, I've, I've heard that from all over the world, from every level of Adventism, and it's one of the easiest truths to defend from inspiration that there is. Brothers and sisters, the only people that receive the mark of the beast are people that, are going to, that will be held accountable for understanding the difference between Sabbath and Sunday, or people that could have understood the difference and didn't avail themselves of it are still going to be held accountable. And when the Sunday law arrives, Seventh-day Adventists are going to be held accountable for understanding the difference between Sabbath and Sunday. And if you are accountable for that understanding, and you keep Sunday instead of Sabbath during that testing time, you receive the mark of the beast. It's black and white. There's so many proof texts for that. It's unreal. At that point, in reality, our probation's closed before that point. Because Sister White calls the Sunday law a great crisis, and she teaches that character is never developed in a crisis. It's only demonstrated in a crisis. We will have settled into the truth, both spiritually and intellectually, so that we cannot be moved before the Sunday law, because she says just as soon as we're settled into the truth, spiritually and intellectually, so that we cannot be moved, then the shaking will come. The Lord in his mercy makes sure that we're prepared for the test before he allows the test to hit. So in reality, our probation is, is over as Seventh-day Adventists before the Sunday law, but at the Sunday law, we will manifest for the whole world to see what character we've developed. And this has been plainly prefigured in history. Early Writings 259. Read Early Writings 259 two or three times. Two paragraphs there. First paragraph talks about a testing time period in the days of Christ. Second paragraph talks about the Millerite time period. I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of Jesus. Those who rejected the testimony of John, there's a first test, John the Baptist, were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. Their opposition to the message that foretold his coming placed them where they could not readily receive the strongest evidence that he was the Messiah. Satan led on those who rejected the message of John to go still farther and reject and crucify Christ. In doing this, they placed themselves where they could not receive the blessing on the day of Pentecost. Step-by-step -step test that they're flunking along the way because they, they rejected the first test. The rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances, ordinances would no longer be received. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted, and the Holy Spirit, which descended on the day of Pentecost, carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly, where Jesus had entered by his own blood 
to shed upon his disciples the benefits of his atonement. But the Jews were left in total darkness. They lost all light which they might have had upon the plan of salvation, and they still trusted in their useless sacrifices and offerings. This heavenly sanctuary had taken the place of the earthly, yet they had no knowledge of the change. Therefore, they could not be benefited by the mediation of Christ in the holy place. End of that paragraph. Next paragraph says, Many look with horror up at the course of the Jews in rejecting and crucifying Christ, and as they read the history of his shameful abuse, they think they love him and would have denied him as did, would not have denied him as did Peter or crucified him as did the Jews. But God who reads the hearts of all, has brought to the test that love for Jesus which they profess to feel. All heaven watched with deepest interest the reception of the first angel's message. 1840. But many who professed to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of his cross derided the good news of his coming. And instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which shows the way in the most holy place. I saw that as the Jews crucified Jesus, so the nominal churches had crucified these messages, and therefore they have no knowledge of the way into the most holy, and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. Like the Jews who offered their useless sacrifices, they offered up their useless prayers to the apartment which Jesus had left. And Satan, pleased with the deception, assumes a religious character and leads the minds of these professed Christians to himself, working with his power, his signs, and his lying wonders to fasten them in his snares. In the Millerite time period, you had a glorious manifestation of the power of God, but you had a testing process that divided the Millerites into two groups. And this history has been illustrated in other passages of sacred history, such as the time of Christ. And when the testing process reaches Pentecost in the time period of Christ, those who have rejected the, the progressive message are left in total darkness. And when this testing process was repeated in the times of the Millerites, those who rejected the progressive test were praying to Satan. And these histories are repeated in our day and age. And when we reach the end of the testing process in Adventism at the Sunday Law, those of us that have flunked the test along the way are those in Thessalonians that receive strong delusion because we love not the truth and we love the lie. It's plainly laid out in Scripture that we, as Seventh-day Adventists, go through a testing process that reaches its climax at the Sunday Law. And at that point, the church is purified. And then the Lord is going to pour out His Holy Spirit without measure. But prior to that time, when the wheat and tares are still together as they are today, the latter rain begins to sprinkle upon God's people in the sense that this history that illustrates the glorious manifestation of the power of God, it begins to be repeated, and it begins to be repeated with an event that comes before the Sunday Law. It begins to be repeated when a mighty angel, the angel of Revelation 18, comes down, and in some way there is something that is worldwide connected with this event. Of course, we're suggesting that this event was 9-11, the point when the whole world realized they needed to decide the fate of Islam. Did the whole world understand this event? I don't not understand it, but recognize it. I mean, yes. And this is paralleling the angel here coming down. So the, the manifestation of the power of God is illustrated in the Millerite time period. And 
Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues. We shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling in hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Brothers and sisters, what is the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign? Is it an emotional experience? Is it an empowerment Is it that we're suddenly casting out demons and healing the sick and raising the dead? According to inspiration, the glorious manifestation of the power of God has been illustrated in the history of 1840 to 1844 and other sacred histories. This isn't the only place. The history of Christ parallels this. The history of Elijah parallels this. There are other places, but we're focusing on 1840 to 1844 because we've been told in a variety of ways that the Millerite time period is repeated at the end of the world. Let me, let me show you something. I have, I've referred to it once. It's nice if you can go through it very carefully. What brought about the prophetic understanding of the Millerites was not simply that they understood the time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. That's what they did. But what brought it about is that Christ, as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, unsealed those truths to those people. If we think it was simply the Millerites coming to understand these things, we're missing the most important point. In Revelation 4 and 5, this is, this is dealing with the Millerites. John is inspired to recognize that no man's uh, able to open the book that is sealed, and he begins to weep. And then we're introduced to the fact that the one that has secured the right at the cross to unfold his prophetic word to his people at certain points in history is Christ. And as soon as that is set forth with us, he begins to unseal the seals, and he begins to teach us about the trumpets. And sure enough, it was the message of the seals and the trumpets, along with Daniel 8.14 and some related prophecies, but it was the message of the seals and the trumpets that the Millerites came to understand. How did they come to understand them? They came to understand them because the lion of the tribe of Judah was unsealing these truths to them in order to produce this experience here. He was the one that was behind the scenes orchestrating all these things that happened. And in that history, when they get to 1844, the scattering of the 2520 has concluded and the gathering time takes place. And for the second time in sacred history, the Lord raises up a denominated people. He raises up modern Israel, paralleled by ancient Israel. The only two denominated people in history were ancient Israel and modern Israel. The Christian church from AD 34 at the stoning of Stephen until 1844 is not the denominated people of God because the denominated people of God are the people that have entered into the covenant with Christ and received his law and his name and have married him. And at Sinai, ancient Israel became the denominated people of God. They entered into a covenant with Christ. They received his law. And we know they were married to him because the divorce took place at the stoning of Stephen. And in 1844, the Lord once again gathered together his people, his modern Israel, and gave them his law. And he married them. That was the, the parable of the ten virgins, the call to the marriage. He gave them their name. But they didn't finish the work. They went to sleep. That's the nicest way to say it. And William Miller's dream says that that history is repeated. The Millerite history is repeated. We're told it's repeated many ways, but William Miller's dream adds a special component to it. William Miller says there were truths that were gathered together. They're represented on that chart. But in his dream, these truths became covered up with rubbish and spurious coins. And there reaches a point where William Miller begins to cry. And William Miller is paralleling John crying. Because when John was crying in chapter 5, 
He's introducing the fact that the line of the tribe of Judah is going to begin to unseal his word once again. And when William Miller begins to cry in the dream, the dirt brush man comes in and he cleans everything up. Brothers and sisters, we're in the time period when the dirt brush man is once again gathering his people together to reestablish this covenant people to stand during the time period when there is no intercession of sin, during the time period when Satan is personating Christ and the world is choosing between Christ and Satan. And as they're choosing between Christ and Satan, Satan is personating Christ. The world is choosing between Satan, who's claiming to be Christ and looks like Christ and acts like Christ, and the world's falling apart, but they're also choosing between Christ, the real Christ. And where does the world see the real Christ? In his people that perfectly reflect his character. We're moving into the time period that all the prophets wish to live in. And we're moving into the time period of the highest calling of all time. And we must understand this. We must understand this because inspiration tells us as God's people at the end of the world, we're asleep. We have to be awakened. We have to be brought back to life. Our greatest need in our first work is for a revival, which means we're spiritually dead. We have to be brought back to life. And the way that inspiration says that we are brought back to life is from prophecy. Prophecy is the tool the Lord uses to say, hey, brothers and sisters, whether you believe it or not, we're at the end of the world. And we have to bring our life into agreement with that truth. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, it may empower us. It will empower us. It may bring about the gifts of the Spirit that we know take place during the latter time period. But the way you and I are going to be required to recognize it is that this manifestation of the power of God has been illustrated in this history, in this history, in a variety of places. So, let me add one more component to this. If you would turn to Luke chapter 21. In verse 7 of Luke 21, the disciples ask a question. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? The disciples in Luke 21, they want to know what the sign is of the end of the world. What's the sign that we are going to see at the end of the world? And... If you go carefully through Luke 21, you'll see that Christ does tell us what the sign is of the end of the world. And if we take up this consideration in verse 24, it says, I mean, I'm passing over a lot, but, but I'm focusing on what we want to deal with here. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, in the, in the articles that Hiram Edson wrote about the 2520 that I mentioned the other day, he wrote six or seven articles that he never finished the series. The title of the series was The Times of the Gentiles. Hiram Edson was dealing with this very verse here. And he went to great trouble to show that the times of the Gentiles in the, prophet, in the prophetic word is when God once again brings together a denominated people. That the denominated people of God, ancient Israel, that um, were divorced of God at the stoning of Stephen, that from that time period um, until at some point in the future was the time of the Gentiles. And... When the Lord once again brought together a denominated people in that history, the times of the Gentiles would be fulfilled, and he suggests that that time was 1798. I had studied this out about 
12 or 13 years ago, and I had determined against the great uh, tide of people that have a position on the times of the Gentiles, I had determined that the times of the Gentiles ended in 1844. I have several strong reasons for that, but normally in the Protestant world and in Adventism, they have concluded that the times of the Gentiles ended in 1967 in the war where Israel regained control of Jerusalem. And the logic is, is that when the, the Jews were driven out of Jerusalem in the 80-70 time period, it wasn't until they regained Jerusalem in 1967 that the times of the Gentiles had been fulfilled and that this period of time between 80-70 and 1967 is the times of the Gentiles. And therefore, when Israel regained Jerusalem, this generation shall not pass till the Lord returns. And that's the Protestant understanding. And that's pretty much the understanding in Adventism. And I don't accept the reasoning that gets you there. I don't usually accept the Protestant understanding of prophecy because they seek to put literal applications on the symbols that we are to understand in a spiritual or symbolic way. And Jerusalem at the end of the world is not literal Jerusalem. It is spiritual Jerusalem. Review and Herald, July 30th, 1901. The city of Jerusalem is no longer a sacred place. The curse of God is upon it because of the rejection and crucifixion of Christ. Paulson Collection 138. We should be gathering up every ray of divine light, not looking to old Jerusalem where Christ once was, but to new Jerusalem where he is now. So my logic was, when I was looking at this times of the Gentiles, is that it was 1844, and then when I found out Hiram Edson said it was 1798, it was frustrating for me because Hiram Edson's logic is strong. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't show where he was in error, but I knew he was wrong because I understood it was 1844, and it was a real blessing for myself when I suddenly realized that one 2520 ended in 1798 and another 2520 ended in 1844, and they are parallel prophecies, and it's in this period of time, from 1798 to 1844, that the times of the Gentiles comes to a conclusion. Enough said on that. Just I can't pass that verse without giving you a little bit of overview on it. There's a lot to say about the times of the Gentiles. But what we're suggesting, which is consistent with pioneer logic, is that Jerusalem is trodden down until the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And Jerusalem, in Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3, was trodden down for 1,260 years by the papal power. And this is one of Hiram Edson's arguments. 1798 is when this treading down is finished of spiritual Jerusalem. If you turn to Revelation 11, 2, you'll see it. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. In either case, whether you accept exclusively the reasoning of Hiram Edson or, or my weaker reasoning, possibly, of 1844. 1798, 1844, which I believe go together now, is the end of the time of the Gentiles. So when when Christ is answering the question in Luke 21 about the end of the world, the disciples want to know what the sign is of the end of the world. He takes them to this time period when God once again raises up a denominated people. 1844. He's going to bring together modern Israel. Okay, so then it says in verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. And when were the signs in the sun and the moon and the stars? We'll just put the stars up here, the falling of the stars. Um, They took place in 1833, which is the same year that William Miller received his credentials. So we have the sign in the, one of the things that, that Christ points us to is he's pointing out this end of the world history is the signs that took place in the Lisbon, Portugal earthquake, the dark day, the falling stars. And then what does he say? And on earth, distress of nations. Brothers and sisters, in this time period here, where Christ has led us to by leading us to the time of the Gentiles and the falling of the stars, 
What was the distress of nations in that history? Islam. Islam. Was Islam. Once again, Egypt was attempting to, to take control of Turkey in order to identify itself as the, the Islamic leader in the world, willing to carry on the warfare against Europe. Do you know who the foot soldiers were of um, the Egyptians during that time period in the 1840s? Who were the, the soldiers that were going to be uh, the primary warriors against Turkey to reestablish the, the Islamic dynasty in Egypt? It was, a, it was a, a sect of Islam in Saudi Arabia that's called Wahhabi. Do you know who that is? Oh, I hope we all know who the Wahhabists are today. The Wahhabi religion is the religion of Ben Laden. It's the identical group of people here at the end that were the ones that were supporting the efforts of Egypt to reestablish an Islamic dynasty by taking control of Turkey, who had formerly been the premier Islamic dynasty. And brothers and sisters, this was distressing for the Europeans. They'd put up with hundreds of years of this warfare from Islam. So Jesus is being accurate with this time period. He says there was distress of nations in this time period, and it's worth us to understand that the power that was bringing the distress of nations was the descendants of Ishmael, whose hand is against every man, and every man's hand is against him. Then it says, with, up on earth with distress of nations and with perplexities and the seas, See in the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. If you've been through this study, don't answer. <laughs> oh, what did the one of the think? Did the Millerites see Christ come in the clouds? Yes. Brothers and sisters, yes. And if you would have said yes, they wouldn't have thought. Turn with me, if you would, to Daniel 7.13. This is standard Seventh-day Adventist understanding. Daniel 7.13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancients of days, and they brought him near before him. Brothers and sisters, what's that identifying? It's identifying October 22nd, 1844, when the work of judgment began. And Christ moves into the most holy place, and when he does, he comes with the clouds. So please, please note, in this history of the Millerite time period, and I forewarned you this was going to get cluttered up here, that right here, I can use the blue, I guess, Christ comes in the clouds. Back to Luke 21. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, there are some... I like to, when I go through a prophetic study, and I like to have an answer for every attribute. And one of the rules of William Miller is, is that when someone does prophecy, they should have an understanding for every word. And, but... The perplexity of verse 25, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and looking after those things that are coming up on the earth for the powers of heaven are shaken. I have texts where Sister White places that here at the end of the world, that men right now, they're going through that experience. But I don't have texts to apply that to the Millerite time period. Um, so I'm just forewarning you, I don't have an answer for that in the Millerite time period. But I'm not so sure that because this is going to be repeated, and we'll show you that this is repeated, this history takes place in the Millerite time period and at the end, that there isn't some kind of overlay. But I'm just being honest about that. Some, I'm not suggesting this, but I don't mind challenging your mind, some suggest that this perplexity and this sea and waves roaring is talking about our day and age when in the recent past there was a tsunami that alerted the world that we're at the end of the world. 
In any case, I'm believing that this passage is talking about the Millerite time period and our time period. Notice, though, that after Christ gives this overview, he gives them a parable. I call this the parable of Christ um, for myself. And he says just some very simple things in this parable. In Great Controversy 308, Sister White says, speaking of this passage, she says, Christ had bidden his people to watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. When these things become to pass, he said, look, then look up and lift up your heads for your de- redemption draweth nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that the summer is nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now, brothers and sisters, Sister White is saying that Christ is answering the question of what is the sign of the second coming of Christ. And he says he pointed the followers to the budding trees. So let's look at these, this parable in verse um, 29. And he spake to them a parable. And I left out verse 28, but Sister White quoted it, so we've got it in the record. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Sister White's more than once, Desire of Ages is an easy way to find it, but more than once Sister White tells us that the fig trees represent um, the Jews who made profession of understanding God's will. And the other trees are the Gentile world that had no Um, profession that they were God's people. There's a distinction here of two groups of people, God's people and those outside of God's covenant people. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the trees and the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. And in Jeremiah 8.20, it says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. The harvest and the summer are synonymous. And in Matthew thirteen thirty nine, it says, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So when it says, when you see these trees bud out, you know that it's summertime. It's teaching that when you see these trees bud out, you know that you're at the end of the world. And remember, Christ is telling them what the sign is that they are to recognize, to demonstrate they're at the end of the world. And what is the sign? Christ, according to Sister White, pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring. Brothers and sisters, what is it that makes the trees bud out. It's the rain, the latter rain at the end of the world. Christ is saying the sign that his followers need to see is the latter rain that causes the trees to bud out in the summertime at the end of the world. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, Know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, in the Millerite time period, the signs that preceded the Millerite time period, there was a generation that was raised up that participated in this glorious manifestation of the power of God, that generation did not pass till Christ came in the clouds. They were there, the generation of the Millerites. But the Millerite time period is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. So what is the sign for us at the end of the world? Because we're the focus of Luke 21. When the disciples ask Christ, what's the sign of the end of the world? They're asking for you and I. The answer that they're seeking is more for us than for the disciples. It's more for us than the Millerites. And the answer of Christ is the latter rain. 
The latter rain is our sign. And where do we see the latter rain? We see it in this history. And when we see this history repeating, what we will see is that, number one, as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that according to Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, at the beginning of the sealing time, that four angels are restrained. They're holding back the four winds of strife in order that God's people may be sealed. Everyone that understands that, say amen. Amen. And Sister White has told us that the winds of strife that they are holding back are symbolized by an angry horse. And the power that is symbolized by an angry horse in Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation is Islam. And on 9-11-2001, a worldwide event took place that identified that we had reached the point in time where the whole world was coming together to decide the fate of Islam, paralleling that on August 11th, 1840, the four great European powers came together to decide the fate of Islam and paralleling the fact that the four angels had been restrained from Revelation 9, verse 14 and 15, and identifying that this history that is the glorious manifestation of the power of God was beginning to be repeated. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 at this point comes down, paralleling the mighty angel of Revelation 10 coming down with the little book of Daniel open in his hand in the Millerite time period. And that's verses 1 through 3 of Revelation 18. And when you get to verse 4 of Revelation 18, you have another voice, which you were, if you're careful to look at, Sister White identifies as the Sunday law in the United States. That's when the loud cry goes forth with power. And Sister White says the second angel's message, which is paralleling the Sunday law, was fulfilled in the United States. We have the Sunday law in the United States. And during the second angel's message, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the Millerites. And here is where the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. Worldwide, in the first angel's message, worldwide event when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, local event in the United States, second angel's message, local event at the Sunday Law in the United States. It con- this history concludes with the door closing into the holy place and Christ coming in the clouds. This history concludes with the door of probation closing for all mankind and Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. And Jesus says, when you see this begin to come to pass, you know that your redemption is drawing nigh and that this generation will not pass. Brothers and sisters, We're not in a simple, we're not simply the final generation. We are the final generation. And Sister White says the sealing time is very short. The final movements will be rapid ones. She says when the message of Revelation 18 comes, there will be new light in connection with it, and it'll come in a way that you don't expect. Brothers and sisters, the seven thunders is that new light. The seven thunders, the seven thunders, the understanding of the seven thunders changes things. Let me show you how, I like this one. I like them all. Revelation 10, verse 4, talks about the seven thunders being sealed up. And in Revelation 22, 10 and 11, just before the close of probation, the prophecy in the book of Daniel that's been sealed up is to be unsealed. And Sister White tells us the seven thunders represents this history here, which is a glorious manifestation of the power of God, but she says it also represents future events that will be disclosed in their order. And she says that which follows the first and second angel's message, which is a representation of the seven thunders, is to run parallel with it. And brothers and sisters, we've run it parallel perfectly for you. It fits what we're saying. It's a perfect parallel. And once you begin to see the the significance of 
the fact that the Millerite time period is repeated, it, it changes things. Let me show you how it changes things. Um, read with me, and if you've been through this, you have to stay quiet. I have, a, I have some trick questions that are destroyed by quick answers. Read with me um, verse 10. Let's start with verse 10 in Revelation 10. Just so we can uh, um, <clears throat> remind ourselves of the Millerite time period. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Now, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> this is a, John here is being used as a prophet to describe the Millerites and their disappointment on October 23rd, 1844. If you believe that, say amen. Wrong. You see, we, that's how we've always understood it. And it's correct. It's correct. But it's a secondary understanding. Notice verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven, this is John speaking, spake unto me and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Brothers and sisters, did the Millerites know they were going to go into a bitter disappointment? John is representing a group of people that understood that they had a disappointment ahead, that they were going to be awakened, empowered by the prophetic word, but it included a disappointment. Primarily, John is representing the 144,000 that have a thorough understanding of the Millerite time period, which is repeated. Whoever, whoever John's representing here, brothers and sisters, before he eats the little book and it becomes bitter in his stomach, he's told that event's going to take place. And Sister White's clear, the Millerites had no idea they were going to have a bitter disappointment. But you know what? You and I do. Because you and I know that the Millerite time period is going to be repeated to the very letter. And when we get to the Sunday law, brothers and sisters, when we get to this time period of the seven last plagues, there's definitely going to be a disappointment. You want to know what it is? When you find out, let me know. <laughs> I, have my, I have my idea what it is. My high idea is, is that, and, and I have text to back it up, but I have no text that absolutely says this is the repeat of the disappointment. My conviction is, is that from the passages where Sister White speaks about the Sunday Law time period, when the Sunday Law arrives, the faithful Adventists that receive the seal of God are going to wake up to the reality that they're standing alone. And that the other Adventists that they thought were going to be standing with them are gone. Gone from their, their support base, but they're still around because those other Adventists are going to be the ones that are turning them in to the authorities. I think that's the disappointment, but... I don't know. One thing I do know is that the history of the Millerites is repeated to the letter and there will be a disappointment. And John is here representing a people that are told in advance what's going to happen to them. He knew it. So in a secondary sense, without a doubt, this is the Millerites. I'm not standing against what we understand and what Sister White says. But it's also identifying the Millerite time period, or the, the time period of the 144,000. Revelation 10 is a chapter that is describing the repeat of this history. It begins in 1840 when the angel comes down with the little book open in his hand, which is the book of Daniel. And it, it reaches all the way down to 1844 in verses 6, is, six and 7. Because in verses 6 and 7 of Revelation 10, it says, and swear by, let's take verse 5, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. This is Christ, according to Sister White, and this is the angel of verse 1 and onward. This is Christ who comes down and empowers the Millerite message in 1840. And then in verse 5, he um, lifts up his hand to heaven. In verse 6, it says, And I swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heavens and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are there." therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer, and prophetic time comes to a conclusion 
And it says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. So verses 6 and 7, 5, 6, and 7 are identifying when prophetic time comes to an end on October 22nd, 1844, and when the seventh angel begins to sound. And you'll notice in verse 19 of chapter 11, which is dealing with the sounding of the, sounding of the seventh trumpet, it begins in verse 15, it goes all the way through verse 19, and verse 19 during this When the seventh trumpet begins to sound, it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hell. When the seventh trumpet begins to sound, you can see into the most holy place and see the ark of the covenant. This is October 22nd, 1844. So verse 1 is 1840. And by verse 7, we've already come to the history of 1844. And then verse 8 begins to tell us, 8 through 10, the experience of the disappointment that's going to take place after this history. It tells us about this history too, because it's in this history when Christ comes down with the book of Daniel open that the Millerites are not only being tested by the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, but they're being inspired and motivated by this prophetic understanding. It's sweet in their mouth. And you come to verse 10 and you have the bitter disappointment and then you arrive at verse 11. And what does verse 11 say? And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again. This has to be repeated. Chapter 10 is consistent with the definition that Sister White puts on verse 4 of chapter 10 of the seven thunders. Chapter 10 is an illustration of the Millerite time period, and it is emphasizing that it is repeated at the end of the world. And brothers and sisters, one of the most important points for you and I about the Millerite time period is that it was a glorious manifestation of the power of God, which is the sign for you and I of the end of the world. Now, you may not know it, but I know it. We haven't done these subjects justice. We haven't taken the time to go through all the hoops that I like to go through to demonstrate this. But what we have done is given you enough information that you should go test this. If what I'm saying is true, you can't avoid the logical conclusion about the seriousness of what I'm saying. If it's true, and you pass by this, this is life or death. Now, if it's false, and you go test it, and you find it's false, then praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, there's people all over planet Earth that are listening to what we're teaching. And if it's false... You have the responsibility to those people all over the earth to warn them that what we're sharing is error. So you would be doing a worthy work even if all you did was demonstrate that what I've been sharing here is error. But if you walk by this information and decide you don't have to test it one way or another, you're not fulfilling your responsibility as a seven-day Adventist. God has providentially brought us here this weekend, and he expects us to test what we hear from the pulpit in an Adventist gathering by his word. And if it's correct, we don't have the choice on whether we accept it or not. If it's correct, we have to accept it. I'm challenging you to test this. One point I just recently read that would give a little emphasis um, and focus on a Family Citizen magazine. They did a recent article on the uh, the mosques in the U.S. 80% of the mosques in the U.S. are funded from Saudi Arabia, and all of those 80% are Wahhabi. No. Oh, wow. Wahhabi. And, and, and we're much better off than, than the other Protestant nations. I don't know if you've been to London, but London's got a lot of Christian churches, but they're all empty on Sunday. But it's got mosque after mosque after mosque, and France is in the same situation. Europe... Well, it only escalates. 
It only escalates. The winds only increase. And the winds are symbolized by an angry horse. And the angry horse in Bible prophecy is Islam. And the third woe is underway. It's underway, brothers and sisters. And I did not share all the arguments on Islam. There are other prophetic arguments. But I finished in three presentations instead of four. Any questions? <laughs> if you want to do questions, we want to get them all. But what was interesting to me, this isn't your, you didn't ask this, it's not necessarily germane, but it is interesting to me. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not political. I'm just not political. And uh, I really, I, I am not. And, uh, and I look at the, the world situation, I try to look at it from, um, from a Christian perspective. But I, you know, when all this started happening with Islam, you know, I, I, I copped a little bit of an attitude with France, all right? I just did, but, but it, which is probably wrong. And r last year, for the first time, I went to France, and it was hard for, it was, this is hard for me to say, but I will say it. France is the most beautiful country I've ever seen. I mean, driving across France, it just blows your mind how beautiful it is. <laughs> but in any case, uh, there was a time when I went back to try to find out more historical uh, proof about August 11th, 1840. And I went to London and I went to the archives where I could go back into the newspapers of the 1840 time period. And it was the discussion of Austria, England, Russia, and Prussia about what they were going to do with Egypt and Turkey. It was the focus of the newspaper. But the, the, the news was coming in two months after the fact because they didn't have you know, communications like we have now. So it was difficult study. You, what, if you were looking for August 11th, 1840 news, you had to be looking in you know, October, November, December. But one thing that was curious about it, and, and you could go back and look. If you remember when, when the United Nations was making its decisions about how it was going to deal with Iraq and Bush was going there after 9-11, if you remember how France was putting roadblocks and everything that was going on, you know, and, and that's where the Americans started really getting frustrated with France with their foolish attitude. If you go back to that history and you look at the four great powers, that are dealing with Turkey and Egypt, France was doing the identical thing. It's just amazing. They were the ones that were trying to prevent any movement, any direction, and it, it was the same history. It was the same history. The tsunami scenario that took place again as a repeat, do you see uh, possible stars falling again? I don't know. Right, they get that question a lot, and, uh, and there are some people that, I have found there are some people that have very strong opinions one way or another about that, and I haven't ever been led into trying to come to a, a position that's set in concrete, so I hate to be casual about it, because there's chances are that some people out, out there have it. They have it all figured out, and I just haven't seen those people that have it all figured out their arguments haven't been convincing to me, so I kind of avoid that question. <laughs> there was a sister back here that had her hand up earlier. Nope. Never mind. All right, this, the... Okay. We have a question here. Can you explain a little bit more about um, 18, October 22nd, 1844, the, the whole bit about them seeing Jesus come in the clouds? In, in Daniel 7, you have the, and this is, um, this isn't any new idea. This is a standard Adventist understanding and teaching, and probably all of us that were converts to Adventism when we were being taught Adventism, we were taught that, that verse 9 of Daniel 7 says, I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. This is God the Father, whose garment was white as snow, and, his, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. I notice that his throne has wheels, because it's about to move from the holy place to the most holy place. It's a movable throne. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. This is the judgment, the beginning of judgment. Judgment set, the books of judgment are opened. 
I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flames. And concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. This is noting that the, the, the deadly wound of the papacy is delivered in 1798 during this, this vision that John's seeing. And then in verse 13 it says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, Christ, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. This is God the Father, verse 9, who's seated upon the throne when the books are open and the judgment is set. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all the people and nations and languages should, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And Sister White takes these verses and tells us that when Christ entered into the most holy place on October 22nd, he came in to receive the kingdom. Um, this is the marriage. And so when Christ comes into the most holy place to begin judgment on October 22nd, 1844, what verse um, 13 is telling us is that he came with the clouds. Now, I'm not saying that he returns to planet Earth. I'm saying that uh, prophetically, when he entered into judgment on October 22, 1844, he came with the clouds. But that, that's, you know, you pop open the Adventist books on Daniel and they will tell you that. That's not new insight. It may be new insight that someone's applying this to Luke 21, but it's there. I have, a, uh, <clears throat> I have several really, what I like stories about the impact of this message around the world, but usually don't take time to share them. But um, I have one that I have to kind of cloak because I don't want to get anyone in trouble. But there was a friend of mine that went to a country that's still communist, very militantly communist. And he took in a case of blank tapes. And there's a, the Adventist radio system broadcasts messages into this country. And the, the underground church in this communist country uh, this is recent, um, within the past couple of years. The underground church in this country will take this Adventist pastor's sermons and, and put them on the tapes and circulate them, and it, it's causing a big, big shaking in this country because people are responding to this message. And when I heard about how many people had been baptized from one case of blank audio tapes, I said, well, I'm going to the Philippines. Uh, I'm giving it away. It wasn't in the Philippines, but it was close to there. I said, if you want, I'll add a leg of the airplane flight over to this country, and I'll go ahead and smuggle in a case of blank audio tapes, too. And uh, the pastor that, that broadcasts these messages into his former country, um, he had to meet me first. You know, he wasn't going to jeopardize the underground church with someone he didn't know, so I went out to California where he lives, and I met him. And uh, while I was there, I gave him the Time of the End magazine. And the Time of the End magazine is a magazine that covers the last six verses of Daniel 11. He says, you read, we met for the first time. It's the only time I've ever met him. And I says, you need to read this magazine. It's, it's present truth. And, uh, and then I took the tapes in. And um, later, this friend of mine that had first taken the tapes into this country, he says, you need to, you need to read this magazine article, and I need to tell you what happened. He says, this, this pastor went ahead and read this magazine the time of the end, and he came into the conviction, this is present truth. So he translated it into that Asian language in this communist country, and they printed 2,000 copies of this book in this Asian country, and they began to circulate, and it caused such a response that 25,000 people joined the Seventh-day Adventist underground church. It caused such a shaking in that country that on the same day, at the same hour of day, every publishing house in that country was raided by the secret police looking for the plates to that book. They didn't find them. But sometimes when you hear this message or you start following this message, you think, well, what's going on? You know, is it, it doesn't look like it's doing very much anywhere. But I personally know, I personally know men and women in every continent of the world that are teaching this message now. It's, and, that, and, I, and I believe we're in the time period that's paralleling Elijah. And Elijah said, Lord, I'm the only one. So the fact that I know a few, I know that I know just a few of the people that are starting to understand these things and take them to the world. And I know that that's, that's not an argument for this message, but brothers and sisters, 
the latter rain is beginning to sprinkle. And we must recognize that. We must begin entering into the experience of the early rain. Or we're going to be found wanting and we're going to make the cry that we read in Jeremiah. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and I am not saved. And we don't want to do that. There will be a group of people who will follow Christ in the most holy place, pray to him, his blood cleanses us from our sins. Where most people out there, evangelical people, believe it was all done at the cross and there was no further more oh, okay. work. And they pray to him, just thanking and, and celebrating already, but the Day of Atonement was a time when people were taking all their stuff off, their things, and putting their total control and total life, and listening to the bells on the hem of the garment of the high priest in the most holy place. Okay. And they were waiting for him to come out so they could say happy sealing to one another, that their sins were totally forgiven. That's what I wanted to kind of explain. Okay, but, okay so you answered it. Yeah, I didn't. I thought you were talking about well, what... What I'm saying is for today, I mean, how do, how do people begin to differentiate this? Because there will be a division where people will still be praying to Christ in the wrong place. Yeah, that's why I was going to Second Thessalonians, but we won't, we won't run down that road. <clears throat> okay, now those people, are those the 144,000? Are those people the 144,000? Well, de definitely the 144,000 are, are going to be part of that. The but anointed in the ones. book of Revelation, in the story of Elijah, at the end of the world, there are two groups of God's people. Uh, you have John the Baptist representing one group and Elijah, the genuine Elijah, representing the other group. And the first Elijah never died. He was carried to heaven on a fiery chariot. And John the Baptist died. So there are two groups of God's people at the end of the world. One group that lives all the way to the second coming of Christ. This is uh, technically the 144,000. But during this end of the world scenario, there are going to be many martyrs. There's going to be many of God's people that are going to shed their blood during the loud cry time period. And they'll continue to do so until human probation closes because the blood of martyrs is what contributes to bringing people into the fold. So those martyrs also will have an experience that, that leads them into the most holy place. Um, so it's not simply the 144,000 that are by faith going to enter into the most holy place with Christ. It's both groups of God's people those that will be laid to rest before his second coming, and those that live until his second coming. So how do you explain the great crowd? I just did. The great crowd would be the second group. Is that That's how I understand correct? it, but it's, you're, you're opening up a can of worms because I'm prepared to defend that. It takes a little while, and most Seventh-day Adventists haven't grappled with that. I, I'm, in, in, the, in the fifth seal, there is some martyrs underneath the altar. And these martyrs are those that have been persecuted by the papacy during the 1,206 years of papal rule. And uh, they raise a question. Um, if you'll turn to um, chapter 6, verse 9, says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, And when he had opened the sixth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes, notice the white robes, were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their servants also until their ser fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So after the Dark Ages, after the papal persecution from 538 to 1798, those between 50 and 100 million people, depending on which historical source you use, if you use Protestant sources, they'll tell you 100 million martyrs during that time period. If you use the Catholic sources, they'll tell you it was only 50 million people that they murdered. Those 50 to 100 million people raised the question, how long till you, to the Lord, how long till you deal with the papacy? And the answer comes back, you just rest in the graves for a little bit longer until another group that dies as you died is developed. And the papal persecution that takes place at the end of the world, 
that's carried out in the Western Hemisphere by the United States and in the European Hemisphere by the papacy is this multitude that is associated with the 144,000 there in um, Revelation 7. And you'll notice the characteristics of the white robes. And this is not standard Adventist teaching. I'm certain that some of those that are hearing this answer of mine in this particular congregation are squirming. But it is in agreement with the message of Elijah, um, which is the message of Adventism, that there are two groups of people at the end of the world, one that get laid to rest, one that live to the end. And um, there's more to be said on that. But Brother, Brother Jeff, to. can I make a statement, please? The, um, the great multitude that our sister here was talking about, um, they're, they're shown as being in heaven around the white throne. And so, from what I understand uh, from Spirit of Prophecy, that those that are the great multitude are those that, that have died and were resurrected from the time of Adam all the way to the end of time. Any statements on that? Yeah, I, I, that's why I said I'm opening up a can of worms. I'm, I'm aware of, of those understandings as, as well. I'm just making an application of the book of Revelation to the end of the world. And there is a group of martyrs that are specifically identified in the book of Revelation during this time period. Okay, this will be our last question. We'll see. <laughs> this is one of those issues. This will be a different flavor of worms. Okay. Um, since you mentioned the, the martyrs uh, in Revelation 6 there, um, Revelation 13... She did. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, we won't point any fingers there. But uh, in Revelation 13, you know, historically we teach the beast that's seen there in chapter, or verse 1 and 2 and 3 is a papacy with the deadly wound healed, which wherever camp you're in on... You know, uh, 1928 healing or healed, uh, or 1929. Do you see the repetition of the uh, 42 months or the, the 1260 days at that point a literal fulfillment um, in now, uh, the papacy's reign at the, uh, the end of time? Okay, you, there's at least three points that I need to mention in what you're, what you're saying. And, um, there's a statement where Sister White says, at the time the papacy was robbed of, this, of its strength, John saw a new power arising from the earth. And it goes on to speak about the United States. And I, I think I probably have that quote in my notes, but that's, that's close enough to the word for word that if you run it in your CD-ROM, you're going to pull that quote up. And the point is, she says, at the time that the papacy was robbed of its strength. That's 1798. John sees this new power rising up from the earth. So you said that we traditionally teach that the beast of Revelation 13, 1 through 3, is the papacy with the deadly wound healed. I don't think so. I think that the beast there technically is the, the beast that precedes the United States. And John is at the point in history of 1798. It says, at the time the papacy was, was robbed of its strength, that's when John saw the beast rising up out of the earth. And he sees this beast in Revelation 13. That's the United States. So John is specifically located in 1798 when he's in Revelation 13. So the beast that he sees at the beginning of Revelation 13 is the papal beast um, of the Dark Ages. Just one point where, uh, th th that I want to make, take it or leave it. The second point. I'm um, just being technical with the Spirit of Prophecy. There are seven, seven different places in the Spirit of Prophecy where Sister White says the 42 months is the 1260 years of papal rule, the 42 months of Revelation 13. She specifically says that time period is the 1260 years. So if you're going to take that time period and place it at the end of the world, you are going against seven places in the Spirit of Prophecy that say otherwise, and I don't think we should do that. And if you're going to do that, as many do in Adventism, one of the, the biggest fanaticism in Adventism is the reapplication of time prophecies that have already been fulfilled. If you're going to do that, usually the logic that you use is, well, look at Brother Pippinger. Revelation 13 um, says, well, I'll read it so I can express the logic. Um, in verse 3, 
Better start in verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great, great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there were given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemy. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. The logic to say that is used on this is, oh, well, look it. This is dealing with the papacy when the deadly wound is healed. Therefore, when it is healed, whenever that is, whether it's the Lateran Treaty or some other manifestation at the end of the world, that the papacy is going to continue for 42 literal months. The, lo- the argument is, is that this is, is sequential. If it is sequential, then I submit to you that it's after the healing of the deadly wound and after the papacy rules the world for 42 literal months that the United States should come up into history from the earth. Sister White, Sister White does have statements where she talks about the book of Revelation being its, in its order, and people use this quote to suggest that we have to approach the study of Revelation in a precise sequential manner, and this allows them to place this 42 months at the end of the world. But I don't think it's, it's correct. It's, the, this passage is describing the, the characteristics of the papacy so we know who it is. Sister White says seven different places that this 42 months is the time period 538 to 1798 in agreement with approaching this passage as simply a description identifying the characteristics of the papacy. And one of the characteristics of the papacy without bringing in the history of when this takes place, is the papacy is the power in Bible prophecy that receives a deadly wound and the deadly wound is healed. One more point, um, different point. Uh, if, you, if we look very closely at what Sister White says about the healing of the deadly wound, the, the deadly wound, yes, in 19, the, the, the deadly wound is a prophetic, a prophetic um, marker, a prophetic expression. And the papacy received its deadly wound in 1798, uh, when its civil power was removed from it. It uh, was no longer a beast of Bible prophecy, but it continued to be a woman of Bible prophecy. The papacy is both a woman and a beast in Bible prophecy. And in 1798, it ceased to have civil power. It was no longer a beast. That's the mystery of Revelation 17, the mystery of the beast and the woman. They're both the papacy. How the papacy once again becomes a civil power. So in 1929, yes, Mussolini did give back civil authority to the papacy. But... Sister White, when she's talking about the papacy returning to power, it's not simply that it has its civil authority returned. It has to be in a position where it can once again persecute. That's the primary point. So that hasn't, that hasn't happened yet. Now, there's, there's a couple other arguments uh, that we've expressed up here, um, and it won't take long, that the pagan Rome had to give three things to the papacy. It's power from 496 to 508. It's seat in the year 330 and its civil authority in the year 533. Notice that the civil authority was given to the papacy in 538, but it did not, it wasn't placed on the throne of the earth until 538. Even though it was given the civil authority back here, it wasn't able to exercise the civil authority till here. And the marker, the prophetic marker, that tells you when the deadly wound is healed, when it, when it rules the world supremely again, has been illustrated in Bible prophecy. It's when, in 538, the third horn was removed. The third horn was, was the Goths. When the Goths fled the city of Rome in 538, then the papacy was in the position where it already received the civil power, now it could exercise it, the civil authority. So when it comes to the Lateran Treaty in 1929, that's paralleling 538. Yes, they've received their civil power, but they are not in a position where they can persecute until the third obstacle is removed. And the three obstacles for the modern papacy are found in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. The first obstacle is the king of the south in verse 40. That was the Soviet Union that was removed in the 1989 time period. The next obstacle is the glorious land, which is the United States. And the third obstacle is Egypt, which represents the entire world. It's when the ten kings agreed to give their kingdom unto the papacy. The third obstacle being Egypt, when when 
when the ten kings agree, when the United Nations agrees to co-rule the world with the papacy, and she's once again placed in that position of power, the deadly wound is healed. And you'll notice in Daniel 11, once she conquers Egypt in verses 42 and 43, then in verse 44, you see persecution illustrated because in verse 44, it says the king, a message out of the east and north arranges him and he goes forth to utterly destroy and make away many. Well, the message from the east and the north, just run east and north in your Bible concordance and it's the third angel's message. The persecution follows the third obstacle just as the persecution followed the removal of the third horn. So the, it, the deadly wound has not been healed yet. It's in the process of being healed. The civil authority has been returned to them in 1929, paralleling 533. But she's not persecuting as she's going to in the very near future. Any other comments? We, have a, we have a study called Prophetic Time that when people ask questions like that, I like to point them to that one because uh, Sister White has statements where she says the same fanaticisms that came into the early part of the work will, will return at the end. And uh, we know as Seventh-day Adventists, if we read very carefully her writings and the history, that there was only a handful of fanaticisms that were in, fanati in, in Adventism that she dealt with. So when she says the same fanaticisms that came in the, in the early part of the work will reappear at the end, we can go back and we can look at the different fanaticisms that she dealt with and know that they're going to be here. And the fanaticism that Ellen White dealt with as a prophet more often than all the other ones combined for her, her entire ministry was the fanaticism of taking time prophecies that have already been fulfilled and reapplying them in the future. Yeah, there was others, but I mean, the one that she dealt with from the beginning, the logic is, is that on October 23rd, 1844, you had 49,950 former Millerites that still wanted to profess to be Christians, so they had to go in and reevaluate these time prophecies that are on that chart in a way that would agree with them still suggesting that they were following the prophetic word. So right from the beginning, there was reapplication of these time prophecies. So she dealt with that one all the way through. I mean, that, you, can trace, you can trace those understandings to the Jehovah Witness Church. Ah. The two witnesses are the Old and New Testament. You're talking about Revelation 11? Yes. Ah, if you go back into the heritage of them, you'll go back into the, the, the experience that we were just mentioning that... Uh, after 1844, the, the people that had been working with the Millerites and had accepted their prophetic understanding of time prophecies, uh, they didn't follow along into Adventism, so they had to reevaluate what they had formerly believed about the time prophecies, and that is the origins of more than one or two other churches, and one of them happens to be the Witnesses. Uh, As we continue to study these things, Lord, I, I plead that that the seeds that have been planted today will not be devoured by the birds Amen. in each one of our lives that that we will see where we are in time and that we will become good bible students and then we'll dig deep to find the ore where the gold is lord i ask that you would be with us now as we depart from this place I pray a special blessing on Jeff as he travels back, that you would protect him, that you send your angels to be around him in a special way. Lord, I just pray that this, this message will wake in every heart in the world and that the, the heavy outpour of the Holy Spirit that will drench every one of us if we're willing to be made willing to receive it. So, Father, I just ask that now you would also bless the food that we're going to partake of now, that it will strengthen us to go from here and give the message that you've asked us to give as a people. So we pray this in the name of Jesus, the one that died, the one that loves us, and the one that wants to save us from ourselves and from this world. 
This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.